office here uh, the day after you present this program. Uh, what's going to happen if I don't have my bulletproof vest on? You wear a bulletproof vest? We'll just say there are a lot of things that we do to protect Huggins. Wow. What do you think about teeth whitening? Hmm. I don't suppose that totally answers the question, does it? <laughs> well, right along with what we were talking about, though. You know, we were talking about the fluid flow. All right, yes, you can whiten the tooth by bleaching it with hydrogen peroxide or acids. And what if the fluid flow, what if your serum phosphorus is below 3.5 and the fluids on the outside of the tooth are being sucked into the tooth? You're taking those acids in and frying the pulp chamber. So maybe it doesn't entirely kill it. Maybe it takes two or three years, but I think we're going to find in a few years. I mean, dentists, are, dentists have a quota on root canals. And they have to do 30 million of them a year now, though I understand it's, the quota has been moved to 60 million. Why do you say quotas? I don't get that part. You don't understand what a quota well, is? Well, I know. Of course I know what a quota is, but why do you say the dentists have quotas? Isn't what they do their own business? Not that I was aware of, no. I mean, it was my business whether I didn't want to place mercury. It was my business whether I didn't want to do root canals. And so my business became destroyed because of that. So, no, we don't have choice in what we do. We cannot. There's called the gag rule. And though there are a couple of states that have ruled that unconstitutional, uh, I'm not sure what they are. One of them was either Washington or Oregon, and it seemed like Connecticut was another one. I'm not absolutely sure, but it's someplace in those vicinities where millions of dollars and time spent has been put into trying to allow dentists to practice a health profession because as it is practiced according to the dictates of the Dental Association, there is no way that I can in good conscience call it a health profession. Ooh. I'm going to pay for that one someday. How are you educating other dentists, and what is your take on the dentists being more receptive to this new knowledge? Dentists are highly receptive to it, but um, I used to be the second most popular lecturer in dentistry. I was lecturing over 100 days a year, and I did not lecture June, July, and August. But what dentistry did to prevent that was to say, if Huggins is on your program, you get no postgraduate credit for the entire program. And in one week, I had 18 months of uh, advanced bookings on programs absolutely vanish. I mean, the telephone was just constantly ringing because the dentists are not allowed. In fact, some schools, including University of Colorado, I heard uh, the other day, has a one-day course on why you never want to meet Huggins or read anything he ever wrote. You've got to be kidding. Middle schools are teaching, do not do things that are going to protect your patient. They're teaching, do things that have been proven to be dangerous to the patient. And they get away with it. Because who's going to try to stop them? Nobody. Do you see dentistry as being able to move into an affordable practice? I mean, most of it's not covered by people's insurance. It's extremely expensive. I'm not saying dentists shouldn't make money. But my point is that I know so many people that are not in a position to mm -hmm. get the help they need, and it's frightening. It's yes. frightening. Well, uh, there for a while, uh, I did work. Now, I haven't done dentistry since 1984. I went into body chemistry at that time, so it was kind of a a farce to take away my license to do what I hadn't done in 15 years anyway. But it scared everybody. But uh, then I got an offer to work in Mexico. So I worked down there. And uh, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 dental cases down there were five to 7000 What we could do was take American dentists down there and have them perform because the Mexican dentistry is not quite the same quality as American. But uh, we took some of the dentists who had lost their license uh, down there, and um, it was a pretty good system because it was highly affordable. Uh, we would treat uh, 20 patients, uh, 20 to 25 patients every three weeks, and uh, nobody complained about the fees, and we got some uh, marvelous things happening. And uh, now it's kind of uh, kind of dangerous to go to Mexico, so that's why I 
I was not kidding when I said if we could find an island someplace <clears throat> where we could do all of this, we could save millions of people uh, a whole lot of suffering. Uh, one guy even offered uh, to put up $35 million to build a ship with everything on it that we needed, the laboratories, the medical facility, dental facility, <clears throat> the places to teach them how to cook and everything that would be offshore a little ways so that they, we were not bothered by licensure. And, uh, you know, I've lectured in 14 different countries, and there are a lot of MDs in particular in those countries who would like to learn my technology of body chemistry. We could bring them in and teach. Uh, one time in Italy, I was lecturing over there. I had an audience of a couple hundred people, which is very nice, but it was in a university. And even in Italy, the people were told if a professor or a student from the dental school at the university were seen at my lecture, they would be kicked out of school, either the professors or the students. So that's how much power the American Dental Association has worldwide. So what happened to the $35 million investor? Uh, he had something to do with uh, $2 billion that was being put up that had under the control of a former president of the United States. And um, the money got diverted into the oil industry instead of into the health industry. And after hanging around for a year and a half, waiting every week for something to happen, <coughs> nothing happened. Understood. Now, that's not too good an idea because when you drive up a ship like that and say, fill her up, <laughs> you better have a million dollars in your pocket because that's what it costs to fill up one of those. Well, there's complications even with a ship because you're under maritime law. You're under a whole different Maritime time. law has nothing to do with medicine and dentistry. Well, there's stuff having to do with the ICC, International Chamber of Commerce. The International Chamber of Commerce has a lot of interesting things in there that can actually interfere with practicing on a ship, but that's a whole other deal. Yeah, that's why I think, give me an island someplace. <laughs> yeah, I think an island is best. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us today? Well, let's see. I have a little list of notes here, which I haven't looked at yet. Uh, what are you going to brush your teeth with? Yes, what are you going to brush your teeth with? One of the best things to brush your teeth with happens to be one of the cheapest, and that is a mixture of table salt, going back to the pickling and canning salt, salt and soda. And 50-50 is a little strong for some people. You may want a little more baking soda than salt in it, but as you get accustomed to it, you can move the other direction, have more salt than uh, soda, and your gums turn into cast iron and just really turn into good health. But... You know, I was raised during the Second World War, and toothpaste tubes were made out of lead, and we had to use lead to kill people at that time. So salt and soda was the only thing we had. I'm still using it. Doesn't baking soda eventually, if you use that to brush your teeth, doesn't it make your teeth extra sensitive or kind of too coarse for the teeth? Well, like I said, I've used it almost 75 years, and it hasn't made mine sensitive yet. What are we talking about, a okay, teaspoon? Let's start out with something like 60% uh, baking soda, 40% salt. You mix it as a powder, put it in the palm of your hand, about a half a teaspoon, and wet the toothbrush, touch it to that, and it leaps on the toothbrush, and have at it. And we have to make sure our baking soda doesn't have aluminum in it. That would be nice. I was wondering whether to bring that up or yeah, not. Yeah, actually, I think it's Bob's. Bob's has baking soda that doesn't have aluminum in it. So I'm writing that down. <laughs> okay. I have his baking powder, but I don't know about the baking soda. We'll have to check that out. That's still the best thing to do to keep the gums in good shape and to keep the decay rate down. Um, I might mention another thing in New Zealand back in the 80s, I think it was around 84 to 90, uh, they decided to do children uh, a whole lot of good over there. So they took all the children in junior high and filled all their teeth with amalgam. And some of these kids were, you know, they had absolutely perfect teeth. Well, now that we've gone about 30 years since then, we're having a real big epidemic of multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's, and it's due to all those fillings. And one of the big men down there, when he found out about our ship concept, wanted us to bring the ship down there and dock at 20 different places and uh, 
um, not at the same time. And 